Welcome to the Business Focus Podcast. Before we start, can we ask one thing? 74% of you that watch this channel frequently do not subscribe. If you've enjoyed our videos, please could you do me a favor and hit the subscribe button? It helps this channel more than you know, and the bigger the channel gets, the bigger the learning gets. Welcome to the Business Focus Podcast. Jonathan Herbs is the host of the Business Focus Podcast. He is a strategic advisor, coach, and mentor to entrepreneurial business owners, CEOs, and senior executives. In this podcast, he chats with entrepreneurs, founders, and CEOs of scaling companies. It centers around their entrepreneurial journey so far and their aspirations for their companies. Hi there, it's Jonathan Herbs again. Um, and today I'm, re- I'm welcoming Abdullah Rame uh, to, uh, to the podcast. Abdullah is CEO of uh, Pablo and Rustius. Welcome. Thank you, Jonathan. Great to be on. Yeah, we're well, yeah, really looking forward to the conversation. So, listen, why don't we start by um, giving me an idea of who you are, um, what you do, how long you've been doing it, and, and the like, please. Sounds good. So, um, as you said, I'm the CEO of Pablo and Rustius. I've been in this role for about four years, but I've been with the company for almost 12 years. So, it's been a long journey. Uh, a quick personal sort of journey. So, I was born in Pakistan. And then when I was about 10, my family moved to Canada. So I did my high school, my bachelor's there. And then in about 2011, I came to Australia, right? So that's at a personal level. I've been on three continents, including an exchange uh, semester at, uh, in Singapore, which I quite enjoyed. And I also speak three, I speak as well as read three languages. So sure. um, uh, yes, yeah, so I have I, quite a diverse perspective and that's what I enjoy. I love learning and I also really appreciate diverse set of um, point of views and uh, and and a diversity of thought. So that that's me on a personal level. In terms of very quick career snapshot, um, what I, you know, I'm a techie at heart. So when I was younger, I was really in, involved even at a high school level with robotics, with coding, so forth. I had some small stints with uh, tech companies, in, including fintech. Uh, in university, I was uh, also working as a teaching assistant and a research assistant. After I graduated, I graduated right in the GFC, uh, which was quite a fun experience in North America, especially. And I I worked in the automotive section uh, sector for a little bit, and then I was looking to do my masters. And at, by this time, I had already gotten into coffee, um, but obviously, I didn't know what coffee was until I came to Australia. But I, I you know I had an espresso machine at home. I was trying to sort of buy some beans, uh, grind them, and make espresso. And I came to Australia to do my master's. I had a lot of family here, a lot of friends. Um, and I started my master's of accounting and I was looking for part-time work. And that's how I joined Papa and Rusty's. Uh, and, you know, it wasn't meant to be a long-term thing. I was employee number three or four back of house. And since then we've grown with, you know, 15, uh, 20 X from where we were. We've grown a number and it's been a great journey. And I've had many roles um, throughout that journey, but now, you know, I've been the CEO for the last four years. So what does Pablo and Rusty's do? Great question. So at the core of it, we source, roast, and brew some of the most delicious coffee uh, that the world has to offer. But we also give a chance to enable sustainable impact with every sip, right? So what our mission is to positively impact people and planet through coffee. So that's what we are obsessed about, right? Amazing coffee and impact, right? That That's what we live and breathe. That's our difference. Okay, so let's step, I'm going to step back a little bit because um, uh, it's an interesting founder story behind Pablo and Ross. Why don't we, you take us through that? Yeah, so uh, the uh, Saxon, right? He's the founder of uh, Pablo and Rusty's and he actually started as a, the brand was started um, as a bit of a joke for his two brother-in-laws, uh, Peter and Russell, so Pablo and Rusty's. And he has a he had a contract roasting background. He put something together for a birthday gift for them. And over time it blossomed into, you know, what it is today, which is a reasonably diverse and, you know, medium sized business. Uh Saxon's, you know, he, he's quite a visionary. He's a serial entrepreneur. He has a couple of other um businesses. He's he's since scaled one of them is Husky, which is reusable cups. They're doing amazing uh things in that reusable space. And, you know, both him and I, we were uh, very technology focused, but also had a real deep um, dedication to both nature, but also pur- purposeful or or business for 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 the benefit of the world. Right, this idea, and that's why it's been a it's been a great partnership and journey of uh, trying to be the best coffee roastery for the world, not just in the world, but also for the world. Okay. 
So give me an idea of the size of the size of the, the enterprise. Yeah, so we're in that you know fifteen to twenty million uh, turnover size. We're about fifty to seventy employees, including a couple of cafes that we have. So that's sort of our size. Yeah. Yeah. So significant. Yeah, medium, right? Like a medium. I find SME as a very weird definition in Australia because it's anywhere from you know uh, ten million all the way to hundred. So you know we're we're, we're sort of on the smaller end still, but uh, definitely growing. Yeah, you probably like four percent of companies in Australia of that size. So it's, you know, it's a significant achievement. Um, so let's talk about the sustainability. Um, you know, I'm I'm going to make a very bold comment that of course Ethiopian coffee is the best in the world. Um, I say that purely on the basis I have two adopted Ethiopian children. Uh, but you know, let's talk about uh, you know your purpose and how that would affect an Ethiopian coffee grower. So I think that there's different facets to the way we look at sustainability, right? So when it comes to supply chain, we're looking at um, working with farmers as much as possible that are using regenerative agriculture or have um, social programs in place. They have commitment to modern slavery. And that's you know not easy in the supply chain, right? So one thing I'll one one thing I always say is that we're not doing this because we're perfect. We're doing this because a lot needs to be done, right? And we're just committed to a better future. Um, we also look at the total miles. Uh, we're looking, you know, uh, and reducing those miles so the food travels where possible. Now, coffee is a global um, crop, and there's you know you need to buy from different origins because different origins grow different quantities and and. Uh, they have different characteristics, but it's about making that supply chain and the people we work with uh, that much better every year, right? And choosing and having sustainability as a key factor in our buying journey. The other part of it and our vision for sustainability is that, you know, by the virtue of existing as an enterprise, we have a footprint and we create waste. So how do we minimize it? How do we measure it? And then, where, you know, where po possibly, how do we reduce it? What we can't, what we cannot reduce, uh, how do we offset it? And then on the other hand, how do we actually create a positive impact in the world, right? So go beyond our boundaries. And so we do a couple of things and, and do this in a way that is verifiable so that we're not just making claims. So our journey started with becoming a B Corp, right? Which is, you know, B Corp is to businesses where fair trade is to supply chains, right? So it looks at your business from how you treat governance, to how you treat your employees, to how you treat the environment, to how you treat your suppliers and customers, and sort of gives you a score. And there's a minimum score to qualify. And also the other thing you do is you change your constitution to say that our primary responsibility is not just to shareholders, but to all stakeholders, including the environment. And then the second part of that was becoming carbon neutral. Uh, and we're a carbon neutral organization under Climate Active, which means that we look at our scope one, scope two, scope three, these are terms for just the emissions that we create as a business. And then we monitor it every year. We try to reduce them. And what we cannot reduce, we look use offsets to, um, to, to become carbon neutral. And the third part of that is the One Person for the Planet program. And that's a unique uh, program where 1% of our revenue, not just profit, so 1% of our revenue, uh, goes back to four planet causes. And this is about making an impact, a positive impact beyond our boundaries, but also linking growth directly to impact, right? So marrying that dichotomy of purpose and sustainability and growth um, so that, you know, we support all sort of um, sustainability initiatives and, and partners in that space. So that's sort of our vision of, of sustainability and impact. And as I said, it's, it's been a progressive journey and there's a lot more to do. And uh, you know, we, we we release an impact pr a report as part of that, so forth. And we what we try to do is that say, hey, we're not perfect, but what we're trying to do is we're trying to over time become uh, a leader in this space. Fabulous! Congratulations! Ah, oh, thank you. And um, I'm going to pick up on the one percent pledge. Um, my business does the same. Ah, oh, lovely! So uh, we do that's amazing. Revenue, yeah, one percent revenue and and one percent of our time. Um, oh. so like a key part of um. Uh, our piece is actually giving back. I, I hadn't thought about doing it um, into um, uh, sustainability, but, but giving back to you know charities, etc. Uh, well, that, that's know. great. Yeah, but it's, it's something we're being driven by. You know, my wife and I um, took a year and a half off in 2015 to work with Australian charities overseas to help them restructure, and uh, 
as I, as I mentioned, I, along the way, we brought home two fabulous Ethiopian babies. So it's um, uh, something we're very, very focused on. So thank you for that. Um, so tell me, it sounds as though you you may have multiple multiple core customers, um, as in you've got a retail and you've got wholesale. So who is your core customer? That's a great question. And as you said, I mean, ultimately, it's the coffee drinkers, right? Ultimately speaking, it's people drinking the coffee. Now, they can be drinking that coffee at a cafe, and our cafe partners are a big part of what we do. Yep. Uh, and I think the specialty coffee industry in Australia, which is world leading, has a lot to, uh, is what it is because of the cafe partners. Um, then we do have a, we also deal with some private label, right? Bigger companies that need more ethical, sustainable, and delicious coffee programs. Mm -hmm. um, we also have a large uh, base of amazing customers that drink coffee at home. Uh, you know, they might have an espresso machine or they might be going camping. And we have, we have a variety of products, right, to facilitate uh, delicious and sustainable coffee drinking in, in a variety of, you know, whether you're going comp camping or, you know, might might be at home, so you might have the bean product. You might be going camping, so you might take our concentrate or portable. Uh, you might have a pod machine, so you might have one of those. Uh, and then office customers too, right? Uh, small uh, to, to larger office customers that are also a growing customer. Uh, and then as I was saying, the concentrate, the concentrate is also in some supermarkets and we're, you know, that's a channel, especially where it comes to that, those sort of products, we are exploring uh, that as well, like export around that. But the primary, you know, it's a very diverse set of customers, but ultimately it's anyone drinking coffee, whether they socially as a ritual for energy, uh, but looking for delicious coffee, but also looking for impact. All right. Thank you. So we've all been through the pandemic. Um, you took over as CEO about that time. What actions um, uh, did you take in the business um, that is, uh, have remained with the business going forward? Yeah, it's it's uh, it feels like a long time away now. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, it's interesting you say that. I mentioned to you that this is interview number ninety six in this series, and um, interview number one hundred. I'm changing that question now. Um, I think it. You know, the pandemic is dead and buried as far as some can say. Uh, but I think it's a great question because I do think um, this idea of pre-COVID and post-COVID, it's a different world. So I, I did I did, took on a, as CEO officially in January and the pandemic happened sometime in March. Uh, so it was, it was, it's definitely a trial by fire, but I, I feel like, and I, uh, we say this as a board, but also as a leadership team that we've probably learned at, at three or four times what and, uh, any, anyone who's not in the leadership capacity at, during that time would have learned. So the, uh, so I'll talk about pandemic quickly and then I'll, the lessons. Uh, pandemic originally was, n no one knew what, I really remember this. I was I was on an overseas trip. I was coming back. A bunch of flights got canceled, then came to Australia. Everything seemed normal. I went up to Brisbane, which I do for a business trip every now and then. And as I was flying back from Brisbane, we started hearing about borders getting closed. This was on a Wednesday or Thursday, and on a on a Friday night, we had an emergency meeting of our leadership team, trying to figure out because cafes are, are a key segment for us, and trying to figure out okay what's going to happen. And at first, it was a financial concern, right? And slowly, as we worked through it, and we have an amazing team who worked collaboratively. From it went from a financial concern, and as the business programs, the the government grants and everything came in, it became an operational and safety concern, all right? And then it became a supply chain and inflation concern. And now it's sort of the new new normal. Uh, so that's sort of the period, uh, the, the, the stages we went through. But a couple of lessons that uh, really stuck with us. One was that being a digital first business is really important. And we were already, because as I said, I'm a techie at heart. A lot of our people really love tech. So we were quite digital to start off with, but the pandemic made us even more digital. And it's not easy for us because we are in the real world's economy, meaning some of our people can be remote or work from home at time, but other roles have to come in, right? There's coffee that needs to be roasted. There's coffee that needs to be tasted. Coffee needs to be bought. Coffee that needs to be packed. Uh, so working in this hybrid environment and making sure that we leverage digital, but also make an environment where all sort of roles have the maximum flexibility they can, but recognize the nature of the role. Um, and 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 set it up in a way that everyone thrives, but can still integrate and and interact with each other. So being digital, I think, and that's something that we're going to continue to see. I think that's a lesson that is going to pay dividends for businesses that are continue to be as digital as possible. 
Um, so that, that's that's one lesson. And the second lesson is uh, digital. What the definition of digital is? Yeah, so I, I think this is a catch-all term that's used uh, for anything that's to do with computer technology, right? So it start it starts off with your you know basic things as document management, collaboration tools, instant management, email, instant messaging. But then it goes beyond that. You know, the software you're using. Uh, integrations you're using, the, the the business systems you might be using. And I think slowly we're also seeing now AI uh, as well as machine learning is becoming a bigger part of that. Uh, and that's what we mean by digital. And then in manufacturing, the second stream is automation, right? like how, how you can automate. So uh, when I say digital, I just mean the top part first, not that automation is not important, but digital, meaning that making sure that you are leveraging the technology available and continually evolving to to adapt and change to what what else is becoming available is extremely important for any business. Yeah, it's it's it is it's look I'm I wouldn't I suppose I probably would call myself techie actually if I think about it. Um, you know my abstract uh, application stack is changing you know all the time at the moment and you know, AI particularly is something that I'm using. Yeah, you know, I use ChatGPT you know at its most basic level. 10 times a day now. I'm actually um, actively coaching clients live with with ChatGPT. You know, we, we, you know, I work on sort of the you know, if you can imagine a purpose to a 10-year vision to a three-year um, vision to a quarterly quarterly sprints. And uh, the quarterly sprints, you know, okay, ours the um, OKR framework. And I'll actually, I actually use ChatGPT with the leadership teams um, uh, breaking out their OKRs and planning out their OKRs. Now it's it's extraordinary how it's changed. You know, um, if my 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 business is essentially a knowledge business, so it's um, uh, yeah. And in fact, the AI is going to be the swapping question for um for the pandemic in the in the new in the new interview series, um, because it's you know everything. And you know, I mentioned to you earlier about. I have video to it if this, you know, my team is global now. Um, we're Australian, um, Philippines, Pakistan, um, Bangladesh. The video editors are in, um, in Ukraine. Uh, that's my, my little bit for the Ukraine. Now. Um, and yeah, with asynchronous, um, communication, it, it just works. It really does. And I would say you're definitely a techie, right? Because techie is not whether you can, you know, you know the latest gadget, but it's about adapting to the latest trends and the fact that you're, you know, we're doing this chat on Zoom, uh, you're applying these tools in your business. And I think just that muscle across the business and, you know, we're doing things all the time and I think leaders have to lead by example. But even today, we earlier we had a people, like all hands between our people leaders and we're actually doing a AI digital demo day in a few weeks where, because a lot of people are working on different things. Some are using chat GDPT. Our HR team had an internal bot they've trained on our uh, policies and stuff that they're playing with still in beta mode. Uh, you know, there's video editing and image editing. I, you know, I play with chat GPT mid journey. And then there's a lot of integration stuff, right? It's where, you know, AI can really help you take minutes, right? Do your OKRs, integrate all sort of uh, documents, uh, and updates and summaries, even instant messaging, right? Like Slack's uh, bringing in all these things. So I think it's something that, you know, if you know, maybe in 2000s, if you didn't know how to use spreadsheets or word processing, AI is going to become like that. But I think well, ChatGPT will do that for you now. Um, it's uh, uh, yeah. I, I mean, it's um, one of the my catch catch prizes is make it easy. You know, I from a strategy perspective. Um, Make it easy for your customers, for your staff, and your suppliers to do business with you, and you will win. You know, make it easy. And um, uh, my plug for a new app that I'm using um, called Buzzsprout, B U Double Z S P R O U T. Okay. So one of the things um, I've been grappling with is how to promote this podcast, and I want it up on Apple Podcasts and Spotify, and in addition to YouTube, Buzzsprout. Um, automatically populates pretty much every um, podcast engine out there. It's phenomenal, uh, including my website. That's amazing. If you do anything with video, with video, okay, which you should be if you're not. Uh, yeah. Particularly in the space you're in, talking you know, talking about coffee and yeah, you know, the passionate people who follow coffee. 
um, have a look at Bell's Rock because it's just, it makes life so easy. Well, definitely, definitely give it a go. So yeah. definitely, I think we, you, we're, you and I are on the same page. Uh, technology in general, AI yeah, in specific, I think should be, uh, and the, the constant, I think the muscle of trying things, if they make sense, uh, adopting them. And if they don't, that's okay, right? That's right. Uh, they're talking, talking about. But it's a, um, and you know, and the big thing about AI, in my business, we, we are particularly working on this. It's not replacing people. Um, what it's doing, though, is making us work. It's accelerating what we're doing, and uh, it makes us work a lot smarter. Uh, you know, I, I think so, right? I think especially at a micro level, it's augmenting our work like technologies have done for many years. Yeah. And people that actually adapt it, I think, in in a in an ideal future, they they become more valuable. They can be paid more, and their work becomes more enjoyable, right? So yeah. that's the that's the benefit. Absolutely. Uh, the, the the quickly the second the second lesson was supply chain management. This is unique to real goods businesses, and that's that supply chains after working for uh, as clockworks for a long time, they started not working like clockworks. So taking supply chain and partner management a lot more seriously has be, is a lesson that we continue to invest in. Even though supply chains have are getting back to as much a stable state as they can, but I think they're going to continue to become a bigger part of real goods economy. Yeah, and it's interesting. A number of my clients have um, uh, one of the lessons they took out of it, or they they implanted early in the pandemic, was they um, bolstered up their raw materials um, significantly because um, they could just see what was, what was coming down the track. At them. Um, it means that they're holding. You know, in the good old days where you know, um, just on time delivery just have, isn't happening anymore. So it changes those those dynamics dramatically. Definitely. Okay. Um. So, um, tell me a bit about um, the future. What's it look like, and, and what do you see as your major challenges going forward? Yeah, so the, you know, we're quite ambitious, and we want to be big because big means that we can have a bigger impact. Uh, overall, we have a lot of tailwinds, a lot of positive signs. There's a lot of people that still like coffee, coffee consumption, and people that are drinking coffee is growing, and more importantly, people that are um, concerned about sustainability and eventually changing their behavior to more sustainable brands is growing. So that's the positive. Now, obviously, we face similar challenges like any other businesses, uh, you know, the Australian dollar, <laughs> the economy, cost of living, inflation, staffing, so much. We have to deal with those those also. And I think specifically as a consumer brand, we are in a lucky place where we're quite different. And we just want to make sure as we're scaling and as we grow that we stay true to who we are and what we mean to our stakeholders and our customers. Often companies, as they grow, especially consumer companies, they drown in a sea of sameness, right? And that's probably the the, the biggest risk for for consumer brands. So I think that's that's the the other challenge that we're quite cognizant of. Okay. Um, so what do you think has been your biggest learning since you've been a, a business um, not owner but a business um, leader? Yeah, so there's many learnings, right? I'm sure everyone has. Um, one learning is that senior leadership, particularly the CEO role, is quite unique. And it's true for founders and business owners also. Uh, it's somewhat lonely. Uh, it's only understood by people who've done it, I think. Um, and it, it it's it's a role of contradictions, right? So uh, I was reading a, a book not long ago, and I saw you recommend the same book, CEO Excellence, right? And they really talk about these contradictions. You know, you have to balance the short term versus long term the legacy versus future, the con being confident, but having humility. And I think um, it's a challenging role from that point of view. Um, but my, you know, I've been quite lucky that I, we have an amazing team and we have a great, we have a great founder, a great board, very supportive. The two main things that I take away, one is constant learning, right? So the CEO or senior leader is almost the chief learning officer and you have to keep learning with intention, yet with the intention to apply it. You have to learn about learning, right? Changing your habits, changing your rituals, even your cognitive frames, and continually building this muscle. Because it's not about being the expert in everything, but being modeling this and truly being a lifelong learner means your organization is going to be a lifelong learner, right? So it benefits you and it benefits people around you. And ultimately, you know, living in this fast-paced and fast-changing world your learning ability 
and your learning methodology and your learning vision is going to make the difference between you and anyone else. Um, and the second thing is having peers and mentors, I think. Having a community of leaders, peers, mentors that you can talk to, that you can relate to, um, and you can talk about things that you can not talk about in, with anyone else. Yeah, it's a, I mean, it, often that's one of the reasons I get I get hired. Yeah. It, um, uh, you know, they, they talk about it being lonely at the top, and it truly is. And um, and it's truly difficult to get a, I was talking to a client um, this morning about, um, you know, getting that, you know, the honest, impartial um, view um, where people, you know, as much as um, their your team can be intelligent and and um, and great leaders, um, a lot of the time they'll tell you what you want to hear, and that's that's really not necessarily what you need. Well, it's not what you need. Yeah, I think that's really important, right? Having mentors, having uh, and peer networks too. So, absolutely. Um, so, um, successful. When you think about the word successful, who comes to mind and why? So th this is this is a great question, right? Uh, because it's such a hard question to answer. Because success is such a big word that means very unique things to different people. So I would answer it in the way of business success, right? And I'm all I really like the idea of purposeful leadership. And two people come to mind. One is Yvonne Chouinard of Patagonia, and I think he's quite important because he brought broke a lot of paradigms for people, right? Can you be big and sustainable, right? Um, can you uh, be both financially viable, a global brand, and do amazing things? And then you know he went on to to found the B Corp movement, the one person of the planet movement, and has had this outsized impact and has, you know, really shown a lot of business leaders of what's possible. A another one is Hamdi uh, Ulukaya of, of Chobani. And he's fascinating because it's yogurt. It's such a simple category. Mm -hmm. And he he did product differentiation in that category. He made an amazing product, an amazing story, and he did it in a way that's very purposeful, true to himself, you know, and, and they're all about giving back and empowering communities and so forth. And he's done that and scaled it uh, over 10 years at a global level. And it's really fascinating. So that's in, in the purposeful space. Um, pure entrepreneurs, uh, for me, it's Steve Jobs, uh, Elon Musk, people like that who've been able to transform multiple industries with multiple teams in their lifetimes. That's my favorite question. <laughs> um, and it's fascinating, um, the answers uh, and the range of answers. Um, so you've, you've come up with two that haven't been mentioned before, which is great. Um, one of the things I've been asked to do recently is to write a book on these, based on these interviews. And, um, and I've decided I'm going to do that. But I'm going to, I will, of course, come back and give the transcript to you for approval first. But um, I'm really looking forward to, to pulling out um, you know, the successful kind, because it's such a range. And as you say, it's, it depends on, you know, how you define success. Um, and it's really interesting. I'm not suggesting, by the way, you're old now, but the younger, um, uh, the, you know, the, the younger, um, uh, CEOs who've been asked that a lot of it's about, um, I'm not going to call it lifestyle, but balance. Um, also the, um, sustainability is a, is a big, a big, th big theme. Where the older entrepreneurs, the older CEOs I've interviewed, founders I've interviewed, uh, are much more the you know the the Musk um, type you know built built you know, what was it four multi billion dollar you know, businesses type thing. Um, so it's really fascinating. And when that when you know when you see a bit of a comparison of this, it's um it's really interesting. It's actually a really great question because it actually is more about the uh, the answer rather than the, <laughs> the question. Very much so. Very much. So. And you know, it's um, you know, purpose for me. It's, it's fascinating. I haven't been the CEO of a very large company, three thousand odd staff, um, to adopting late in life. Um, for me, uh, if you look at my diary, it's all driven around my family and my children, um, and giving back and giving knowledge like like I'm doing here. It's um, uh, but it's it's about things like building them, building memories, both for my clients and also for my family. That's interesting. Um, so you you are a reader, you're a learner. Um, what would you recommend in terms of business books? Uh, I I re try to read a book or listen to a book once, one book a month, if if, if not more. 
But in terms of business books, the three I come to, other than CEO Excellence, which I think is a great book for CEOs, one is Let My People Go Surfing by Yvonne Chouinard. And I just think anyone interested in purposeful uh, leadership should read the book just because he breaks a lot of paradigms, but is also quite authentic about the challenges um, of running a business as well as try to make it a purposeful or sustainable business. Uh, another one is Five Dysfunctions of a Team by Patrick Lynch. Hey, Patrick is you know, one of my favorites just because he, he can his frameworks are very simple to apply and teach, which goes a long way. Great. Um, Pat Lindsay, um, his the five dysfunctions is one of the key planks of, of, of my coaching as it turns out. Um, and there were some phenomenal um, exercises um, in you know, Yes, he writes these books as fabulous, but when you actually get into the the teaching materials behind, there's some phenomenal exercises. And I benchmark my client teams um, six monthly based on based on his framework. Um, yeah, I think you know his um, he, he, the business advantage, the five dysfunctions, the ideal team player. He has the new one, the six kinds of genius. But his frameworks are quite good, and the five dysfunctions, particularly, I think you know cultural is this, culture is this word that's very ambiguous. And you know, as some people in my leadership team, they've always said, you know, like so ambiguous. You know, what do we mean? So forth. So over time, the five dysfunctions is a great way to sort of break down some of that culture and say, well, this is an aspect of culture that's very concrete. You can build on it. You can teach it. You can apply it. Uh, apply it. So yeah, it's it's definitely one uh, up there. Yeah, and, uh, and and you can yeah, but uh, you can also track it. And you can track it hundred yeah, percent. Which is um, uh, which is a critical part. Well, thank you. Um, so second last question. Any last piece of advice or um, parting words you'd give to an entrepreneur or an aspiring entrepreneur? Yeah. So I want to come back to that idea of success, right? And I think success means different things to different people. And that's perfectly okay. And it's important to take some time and 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 really define uh, what success is. And one one way to do it is to work backwards, right? Like imagine you have a long life, uh, you're on your deathbed, like what sort of life would you have liked to live? Uh, both business, personal, so forth. And then living that life and not, not living somebody else's definition of success, whether material or otherwise. I think uh, Th that's probably the insight that has been most powerful for me. Great insight. Great insight. The other one, it's it's really interesting. Um, in in contradiction to that, there's um, uh, so I always had a, a coach or two coaching me at any one time, and over the last couple of years, I had a guy called Dan Sullivan who has a business called Strategic Coach out of the US, mm. a very very successful entrepreneur coaching us, and um, he wrote a book. Um, in the last year, I think it was called the gap and the gain, mm. and because um, the problem with the you know, visionaries, um, um, the entrepreneurs who are visionaries is, and I had a great example of that um, four weeks ago. One of my clients, um, their board member, had a um, fabulous house up on the hill above Palm Beach, and it was a perfect, the perfect time to actually um, have this conversation with the leadership team. And it was, you know, if you think about a vision. Um, and this, um, you know, the problem with the vision, you know, looking, it's like the horizon. You look at the horizon and you never get closer because, you know, the horizon keeps getting further apart. Um, so measuring yourself against a vision, I'm not suggesting you are, but um, this is sort of just one of those teaching points that I'm throwing at. Um, yeah, it can be very frustrating for, um, for, for leaders. Mm. As in, he called, um, Dan calls that the gap, you know, the gap between where you are and the vision. Versus um, the guy, um, and it, this is another thing I do with my clients um, every every three months. Um, we measure um, the gain. So you know, if we think about where you were when you took over as CEO, you know, um, you've just started. Pandemic hits. Um, supply chains turn to shit. Oh, sorry, <laughs> um, uh, this is not an X rated um, podcast. Supply chain, the supply chains. Um, Turn of crap, you've got to work how to work remotely, but at the same time protect your people who are coming into the factory. Um, you've got to work out how to, you know, how do your coffee shops you know, continue? You've got to you know, grow the you know, sustainability, etc. You think about where you've come from in the last three years. You progressed the business and yourself and your team unbelievably, and you know they're the sort of things. Um, 
that, as I said, we do this every quarter with my clients um, to make sure that the, the team and the, and the, the entrepreneur is grounded um, of just what they're achieving because we forget that. And we also quite often forget to give gratitude. Um, and, yeah. Um, uh, yeah, so I, you know, I think it's, it's my view, it's a, it's a mixture of both. It does, right? And this comes back to the the contradictions, right? Because great leaders have to be able to do both. And you need the gratitude, right? Uh, And one of uh, my mentors uh, suggests, right, like a journal of, like writing a journal of achievements, right? And things you're thankful for, so forth. Uh, And, and, uh, but at the same time, because it's, it's, it's the, it's the paradox, the paradox of being content, but not being content, right? Right. Because so you can keep progressing. And the other thing of that is, I think the the other shade would be that um, you may hear what's important to you, though, right? So for you, your gain in X, Y, Z might not be meaningful because it's meaningful to somebody else. But for you, your family might be really meaningful or your personal uh, development or material gain, whatever it is. So, but I think that that dichotomy is really important and and it's a balance. And I think uh, different leaders need it in different capacities, though you're absolutely right. The, you can get very... Uh, frustrated and burnt out if you're just looking at the horizon yeah. but if you're looking too much on progress you can also not achieve your potential and so fa- it's a it's a fascinating paradox and you know if you think about it Abdul this comes back to where you started you're, you're a purpose-driven organization that's dry and that, that's driving you into the future 100 percent, and that's the paradox we have to straddle fabulous now listen you dropped me an email earlier about um an offer to um uh, to my listeners I definitely did. So if any of your listeners, I'm sure many of them are coffee drinkers, either in their office or at home. So uh, there's a code they can put in to either get 15% of a, off a one off purchase uh, or off a subscription. And uh, I think, you know, if they love delicious coffee and they love sustainability, then they're going to have a good time. Great. We'll put that into the show notes. Hey, awesome. Bill, thanks so much. I've really, like, like always, I've really enjoyed the conversation. Likewise. Thank you for the invitation. No, my, my pleasure. And thank you for joining me. If you are hearing this message, you've listened to the entire episode. And for that, we want to thank you from the bottom of our hearts. We hope you enjoyed this new episode. And if you did, please leave us a review on YouTube, Apple Podcasts, and Spotify, or wherever you watch slash listen. Please share this episode with others who may be interested in this topic. If you want to be a guest on the podcast, please send an email to admin at scaleupgrowth.co. Put be a guest in the subject line and tell me a little about yourself. If you want to gauge where your business growth potential is and identify where the biggest opportunities in your business lie or where the key needs that you need to concentrate on right now are, take our assessment where you will receive personalized advice for improvement. It's quick and free. Go to scaleupgrowth.scoreapp.com. If you would like to work with me one-to-one, I love coaching and get the best outcomes that way. Send me an email to jonathan at scaleupgrowth.co and put one-to-one in the heading. Tell me a bit about your business and let's see how we can apply a great strategy for your business. So that's it for this week. Tune in next time for more great learnings from a scaling entrepreneur.